I'm delighted to be here with you today, and I so appreciate the worship team for leading us out using a couple of my favorite songs. Uh, Take My Life and Let It Be has always been one of my absolute favorites. And uh, today I'm going to share my testimony. Now, I think when I was much younger, I might have said I have a Christian testimony, then I have a professional life, and then I have a, you know, I have a T-cell life. Today, I have kind of worked through some of those issues regarding integrity in my own life, and I'm here to share just my testimony. And my testimony includes my spiritual life, it includes my TESOL profession, my profession as a teacher of English to speakers of other languages, it includes my work overseas and my work here. That is all part of one single testimony that I feel that I have in a very integrated sense. And as Alan said, um, I'm kind of basing this on the recent work that I did to uh, come up with this book published by William Carey Library, Teaching English in Missions. Now, whether you are uh, in missions overseas or here locally, it's pretty much the same thing in many senses, not in all senses, but in many senses. And so I hope that what I have to share today will be relevant to you wherever you are, wherever you are working as a minister for for Christ. Um, My path so far has taken me in several places. I was born in Indiana, but when I was 10, my parents became missionaries, moved to Brazil, and that was my first experience that I draw on heavily as an educator, because when I was 10 and we moved to Brazil, the thought at that time was, children pick up languages very quickly and easily. So, put the kids right into Brazilian school. I went to a Brazilian school where not one single person in the entire school campus spoke any English. There I was, speaking no Portuguese, as a 10-year-old in fourth grade, and I was there by myself. (laughs) My brother was in another class, but I never saw him the whole school day, and there was no one who spoke any English. I draw on that experience quite a bit as as a teacher educator, and how Uh, how destructive it can be to presume that children just pick up languages quickly. I married a Canadian, so therefore when we got married and started our lives together, we were pastoring a church in Canada, and while there I taught English, and I will share about that in a minute. Then God led us to our first overseas assignment, which was in, the country flag is Indonesia. And we were there for four years. Then it was a time of political turmoil, so we left Indonesia and went to Brazil. During our five years in Brazil, we planned to stay there for the rest of our lives. We were happy in our, in our ministry there, and I'm going to be sharing what I did in TESOL ministry there. But at the end of five years, our permanent visas were denied. So... God led us back to Indonesia, and we spent another term of service in Indonesia. We were back to, in the United States for a while, but then God led us to Kenya. We expected to spend the rest of our career in Kenya. You know, isn't it just like God to, I'm so glad he doesn't show us the path ahead of time, because I would have gotten whiplash just thinking about it. But I am now at Messiah College, uh, and that is a transition that I will share a little more about later. But through it all, God has had me ministering through TESOL, teaching English to speakers of other languages. That is my ministry, that is my profession, that Everyone who knows me would say that is my life. (laughs) So uh, I am thrilled that God has seen to give me this passion and to use it for his honor and glory. Um, My various experiences have led me to consider uh, types of ESL ministry. 
I was, I worked in Canada for eight years. I taught in Ontario. I taught in programs for adult immigrants uh, and loved that kind of ESL teaching. That may be the type of teaching that some of you are involved with. In Indonesia, I set up a program, I set up ESL programs for both elementary and high school in an international school. In Brazil, when God took us there, I developed a Christian English school for both a seminary and the community members. Now, this was something that was a little bit novel at the time to have an English program run through a seminary to meet the needs of diverse populations. Some of the things that we did there, we started with an adult program, then eventually had a youth program and children's programs. We served others by meeting felt needs. English was a big one, but we also had English classes that focused on cooking. We had English classes that focused on rearing children. We had English classes that focused on fitness. We did a lot of diverse types of English classes in that program, and we became known for that. People were attracted to our program, and many came to know the Lord, and many grew in their faith through evangelism and discipleship. I, we, were, we had goals to do both of those there. And I would just like to say that Kitty Perguson has published a book on, um, on English ministries through seminaries, and I have two chapters in there outlining this program. Then, because we lost our visas to Brazil, uh, God took us back to Indonesia, and there I was able to develop a Master of Education program for Indonesian teachers. Now, in Indonesia, uh, some of you may know, it's a largely Muslim country. It is very difficult to plant churches in Indonesia, but Christian schools are growing like crazy. And there are, is just a lot of openness. There are wide open doors in the area of education and developing Christian schools. And so the mission organization that we were with said, look, we want to start a Master of Education program for these Christian teachers. And so I began doing that. It was going very well. I would often be asked to consult at a Christian school site. So here's the reality of how things have been in Indonesia. It's getting better now. But I would go on to a school site of a Christian school that already probably had about 500 kids enrolled in the school. So these are not small endeavors. They have already grown quite, quite large at the point that they are having questions. So they would invite me to come on campus, and sometimes I would talk to the, all the board members and all the school leadership and the teachers and discover that nowhere, anywhere on campus was there anyone with any training in education. So what had happened was that churches just started meeting this need and were doing the best they could, but were really struggling. By the time you have 500 kids and you don't know anything about curriculum development, you can have some problems. So they were dealing with that. And this program attempted to begin to meet that need by training teachers in Christian school education. While I was in Indonesia, I was there to develop a Master of Education program. But I want to share in it something that happened to me after just three months going back to do that. I felt God saying to me one day, go to a Muslim school and offer to teach English. Now, this was not an audible voice, but it was the closest thing to it that I personally had ever heard. And I'm going, wait a minute, I don't, know, I don't even know where there is one. Now, the public schools are pretty Muslim as well, but in Indonesia, there are Muslim schools developed by a mosque that are quite uh, Muslim in their orientation. And so I'm, I'm arguing with the Lord saying, I don't know where there is one. And he's saying, go out walking and I will direct your feet. 
Now, I don't operate this way. I'm a very planned person. You know, if I'm going to go teach in a Muslim school, I would have planned that six months prior and had a, had a plan, you know. This was not what I would naturally ever, ever, ever do. But I also thought it could be dangerous to argue with God. So I said, OK, I will do that. Now, in Indonesia, the roads are all twisty and turny out in the villages. And you know, so I set out walking. And after 10 minutes, I was lost. And I was just hoping I was going to hear God's voice again to get me back to my house. So I'm walking, and you know, I don't, I'm following the paths, and I don't know where I am. And after about 20 minutes, I look up, and I see Sekola Islam Negri. And I knew that that was the school. That was a Muslim elementary school. And there's the mosque. And there's the school. And I'm going, God, it's really here. You know, and he, yeah, OK. <laughs> and so I decided to go back to my house and pray for a couple of days and then come and talk to the director. And then I started praying, God, get me back home. And I made another turn and discovered that I was only 10 minutes walk from my house. I walked down a road, went across another road, and there was my house. And I'm going, oh my goodness. So I did pray. I went back into that school. I had a conversation with the director. Well, several people started talking to me and brought in more people. And finally, the guy in charge of the school, pretty much kind of like the principal, was having a conversation with me. My Indonesian wasn't great at this point. And it was all taking place in Indonesian. So I'm not sure if I lost something in translation. But the conversation seemed to go like this to me. One of the questions he asked was, is this a mission? I thought, oh, Lord, you promised to give us the words we need to respond how you want us to respond. And I have no idea what that is now. So please help me know what to say. Is this a mission? Now, because. I am through and through an English teacher. That is who I am. That's my identity. I said, I want to help your school have a really good English program. Do you want that? He said, yes. Do you want any money? And I said, no. And I, I explained to him, prior in the conversation, I had said, I'm a Christian. My husband is teaching at a seminary here, but I don't have a job, and I would like to teach English at your school. <laughs> I'm not sure I said I didn't have a job. I did have a job, but <laughs> I don't have a job teaching English right now. I was training teachers. So I said, I'm not teaching English right now, and I would like to teach at your school. And so he considered all that information, and finally he said, yes, that would be very good. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up teaching at that school for three years. I taught grades one through six at first, and then I had to kind of zero in my time a little bit better, and then I ended up te teaching grades three to six for most of the time. Um, so much happened during that school. God taught me so much during that school experience. And one of my first experiences there went like this. I had been teaching there for about a month. And I was trying to teach the pronouns he and she. In Indonesian, there's only one word, dia. To confuse it, it's the same as day in Spanish and Portuguese, which I already knew. And so, But dia means he or she in Indonesian. And so the gender difference is difficult. So I was going around tapping a little boy on the shoulder saying he, tapping a little girl saying she. I thought they were tracking with me on this. My daughter Dana was with me that day helping me. And I pointed to Dana. And I said, he or she? And they all looked at me and said, he or she? <laughs> And so then we ESL teachers really know how to change our facial expression and our voice and all of this to communicate. So I pulled out all the stops on all of that. And I said, he or she. And then they all looked exactly like me when they said, 
he or she. They were little Jans sitting there, you know, doing this. And then I, it dawned on me, they don't know the English word for or, and they're not picking up on that through my tone of voice, so I will say that in Indonesian. So then I said, he atau she. And they all responded, he atau she. <laughs> they didn't get the question that I was asking them. Why? Because in their school system, they don't hear and process questions. They are not taught through questions. They are not experienced with questions. The way they are taught is through rote repetition. That's what they were used to doing. So they were rote repeating everything I said. And that led me to a big personal revelation is how much critical thought development can happen in an English class. And I began to really focus on this. By the time I had been there six months, none of my kids were doing that. They could process a question, they could think, they could do group work, not great, but some, you know, they could try. And they were learning and growing in many ways beyond he and she. I was also, I also felt that I was able to impact the teaching and learning experiences in that school because other teachers would come in and watch how I was teaching. And it was all very unusual and strange. I was the only white person, Christian, who had, of, of any sort, either of those, that had ever been on that campus. And finally, towards my en the end of my time there, I had been there for three years, and I wondered, God, what, I, what have I accomplished here? What have you accomplished through me here? You know, I haven't been able to talk about Christ, but I'll tell you some of the things I did do there in a minute. But I haven't been able to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, I wouldn't have lasted more than a day there had I done that. But God gave me the parable of the seed and the sower. You know, if the seed falls in the thorny ground, it can't sprout. If it falls among the rocks, it can't sprout. But the one that really stood out to me is if it falls on the beaten path, it cannot sprout. And I'm going, my goodness, that's exactly what this place is. It's a beaten path. I get it now. And that environment there, the Muslim culture, at least in Indonesia, I won't speak for anywhere else, but it is a beaten path. There is one path in life, and that, it is, that is it. There are no questions asked about other paths or possibilities. There are no questions. There are no choices laid out in front of people. It's a beaten path. And I felt that my English class plowed that ground. Those children, I believe, will have a little different capacity when they're older to have some choices. God then led us to Kenya, uh, a seminary there. I won't be talking a lot about this, but my word, the <laughs> potential in ministry. It, on the left-hand side, you see the a seminary classroom, and then up there, uh, a girls' school, 1,200 high school girls, um, and just the, the ministry potential through the teaching of English. Even though Kenyans Kenya speak, Kenya speak English, uh, there's still a lot of development needed at various levels, various types of English, a lot of ministry potential. And I'm going to move on here. So, in solidifying for my book and reflecting on the types of, of ministries, the types of English teaching that I have done, I taught in, in ESL classes for immigrants. 
I taught ESL in English medium schools, the international school in Indonesia that we worked at our first term there. EFL, English as a foreign language in schools of different cultures and religions like the Muslim school. And EAP or English for academic purposes in seminary settings in Brazil and Kenya and Indonesia. And that was the impetus for my book. I had a couple of questions brewing at the end of all of this. Missions and ministry. Um, I felt that there was a lack of or inappropriate evaluation of English ministries and a lack of definition of what constitutes effectiveness in those ministries. And this came to a head as I'm sitting in Indonesia filling out my ministry plan or preparing for our annual meetings where we have to show that we have reached goals. Now, do any of you do this in any of your work? It's part of the, it was part of the mission organization that I was with. You know, you have your annual meeting, you set your goals, and our goals had to be, what are all those acronyms? They had to be um, <laughs> the smart ones. <laughs> Some of you have heard of those smart goals. <laughs> Well, it focuses kind of on a product, and you're supposed to show something for having done what you've been doing for three years. And with the Muslim school, I was at a loss. You know, what, am I, what, what do they want to see from me that I have accomplished there in three years? Uh, my students don't wrote repeat after I say a question, you know? So all of that was, those were tensions for me. And then, about the same time, we started seeing several articles in the field of TESOL. One was called this, Teaching English as a Missionary Language, not in a flatter, uh, flattering sense at all. Um, and it was kind, the, some of these articles were accusing Christians of lacking integrity. And I'm thinking, whoa, something's really wrong with this because Christians of all people should be full of integrity and are, are we, but other people don't see that or are we not? And so all of these things were kind of coming at me as questions. Now I'm gonna talk about integrity first and then effectiveness after that. Integrity, kind of at times in my life felt for me like this, a tug of war. And I've got my TESOL professional side over here, and then I've got the fact that I'm a Christian missionary after all. And I would go to TESOL conferences and I would be like, uh, please don't look at my tag. It says OMS International, and then I'll have to explain what that is. That's a missionary organization. No, we're just not gonna go there, you know? And I. I kind of had some envy of people who could put cool things like Wheaton College or uh, you know um, Anderson University on their tags so that maybe no one would know they were Christians. No, they would know that about Wheaton, but maybe not about Anderson, you know. And so I'm thinking all of this, like why do I feel this way? Why does it feel like these are two separate parts of me. That should not be. So this was a struggle I had. I'm going to put up here some verses on integrity, and I'm actually going to give you about two minutes to read those and think about this question. What is integrity in English ministry? I'll sit down and let you read and think for a minute. And you can talk to your neighbor.
if you've had time to read, turn to your neighbor and say two or three words that you think should characterize integrity in English ministries. I know I didn't give you nearly enough time to talk, but I will just say that this last verse here has been my life verse as ministry. And um, so I put that in there because to me it also speaks of integrity. I came up with these words. First of all, an analogy. Batik is a craft done in, in Indonesia and other places. Do you know? How you see if something is really batik and really good batik? Who knows? Some of you know. This is a piece of batik. It looks the same on both sides. If it's really good batik, that's how you know. It looks the same on both sides. Isn't that a great analogy for integrity for us? We're the same on both sides. On the Christian missionary side, I'm the same as I am on the TESOL professional side. It doesn't mean I'm going to say all the same things in different contexts. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that I am the same person. I came up with this set of words. Transparency, honesty, respect for others, teaching well, and being both Christians and English teachers at all times, though we do have different sets of filters that are appropriate for different contexts in terms of what we say. And I want to spend more time on effectiveness, so I need to move along. And by the way, if anyone would like this PowerPoint, I'd be happy to email it to you. What is effectiveness? Now, I'm going to share a little bit of humor here. Um, in my family, my mom wrote letters from Brazil the whole time they were there. Starting in 1970, she wrote letters back to her family. And when her parents and in-laws died, they, they had saved all those letters, and they gave them back. And now my mom is transcribing all those letters. So she's writing, all, she's transcribing all those, these letters, typing them out, and emailing them to all of us, me and my three brothers, and we're reliving all of these experiences we had. I grew up at the end of everything, right by a river, the, beyond the end of the pavement, beyond the end of telephone service, beyond the end of everything was where I grew up in Brazil. Now, so it was a great place to have pets, only we weren't eff very effective with that. We had three different monkeys, uh, none of which were good experiences. One died of lockjaw, and he had bitten my brother and my dad, and they had to get shots for rabies. So our, our life with monkeys didn't go very well. We had parrots, and at one point, my dad built this great big outdoor cage and put the parrot and the monkey in there. Now. The, that didn't go very well. The parrot actually unlatched the lock and let the monkey out. <laughs> so that was it. And then we tried to train the parrots to say certain things, and nothing we ever taught them stuck, but they learned two words. They would say, what? Apparently hearing us say what all the time. What? And mom. <laughs> mom! <laughs> So, so we had this parrot that could say what and mom and nothing that we tried to teach it. And my brother kept snakes in, now not pets because it's dead, right? But 
my brother had a collection of snakes in jars. We had lots of big snakes. I have a 22 foot long snake skin that was caught where I grew up. And, uh, but I didn't bring that today. So we had snakes in jars, my brother did. And one time when he was away at boarding school, one of those snakes in jars on top of his bedroom closet burst. And the snake was you know, coming out of the jar, hanging down over his closet. And my mom had to clean that up. <laughs> so we're reliving these experiences. Finally, we raised boxer dogs, but raising them somewhat ineffectively because my little two-year-old brother at the time had just, um, we had had a baptism, and he was very impressed by the baptism. And he wanted to make sure that our new set of boxer puppies went to heaven. And so he baptized a whole litter of boxer puppies, and they went very quickly to heaven. So my family, so if we're thinking of effectiveness, I would say us, the Edwards family and pets, not so effective, okay? But contrasting that to my parents' effectiveness in raising children, and that's my infamous picture of how I looked on furloughs when I was growing up. Uh, because my brothers and I sang in, you know, what was thought to be at the time appropriate Brazilian ethnic dress. <laughs> this is very dated, but it's how it was, you know. And um, so we sang, I played mandolin. But the point I'm getting at is that my two older, the, my two brothers closest to I, and we all became missionaries. My youngest brother got a job with Citibank and supported us. <laughs> so, so, not so effective with pets, but very effective with children. My parents were very effective in raising us. So I'm using that as kind of a picture, maybe, of effectiveness that we can uh, remember. Um, a verse that, that comes to my mind considering effectiveness is whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not human masters. I think of what is effectiveness in English ministries. To answer that question, we need to look more at what kinds of English ministries there are. And I'm going to kind of be rushing through this last part a little bit, but this is all also in my book, and I do have those for sale here for, t for $10 out on the table. But you can also get it other ways, of course. But I started looking at TESOL ministry context, and I decided to zero in on the fact that we can be ambassadors or hosts. We are ambassadors if we're going into someone else's space, like I was going to the Muslim school. We are hosts if we're inviting other people into our own space. And then in those spaces, we can have evangelistic efforts sometimes. Sometimes we are working with people who are already Christians. And those are discipleship efforts. And both of those are really needed and can be very effective through English ministries. So this gives us four contexts, ambassador evangelism. And I would say that is an other school context, some place that we go to as ambassadors. An example for me is my work at the Muslim school. Ambassador discipleship, sometimes we are going out to someone else's school or seminary. Sometimes the people in those places might not have such a vision for discipleship. But when we go there, we can bring that vision with our materials and the possibilities of things that we can do. And that is an example. An example for me is working in Christian schools in Indonesia, where the, the view of discipleship through an English class was a novel idea. Then, um, when we are in our own space, as we are possibly when we have our own church program, or as I was in Brazil when we developed that Christian English school, 
um, we can do what we want to do in that space. And the same with discipleship. An example being a seminary that we are in our own territory and we can just really provide what students need for discipleship through an English class. We add to this, to this concept of the ministry types, a whole host of issues about English teaching contexts. And you're familiar with these, but I just list them there. I'm not even going to read through them all, but they include things like the language, the learning level, the language level of the learners, the ages of the learners, the backgrounds of the learners, the cultures, the needs of the learners. So, and I'm sure I don't even have them all listed here. So we add to the ministry types we add a whole lot of other factors that we also need to consider in effectiveness. And that brings us to a deeper question. And this is something that I have posed to mission organizations. We often, we often fall into the trap of, of looking at effectiveness only in terms of a final product. What is a final product? Okay, in missions, this can look like how many people have come to know Christ? Okay, so that's an end result, a product view. Or even in education, we can look at it like, so what are the final scores on the test? And that also is a product view. There are obviously times when we need to measure product, uh, an end result. I'm not saying that, that there aren't those times, but I think we need to add a concept of effectiveness as an endeavor is effective if your process is reasonable and good. If you are doing appropriate things, then your process, then it, is, it can be effective. And in the Great Commission, I see as much process as product. I see going as it could be a process. Making disciples can be a process. Teaching can be a process. So I think we need to consider more of a balance between product and process. And that brings me to hallmarks of effectiveness. Now, I have this in 15 pages in my book, and I'm just going to try to give some very, a, a very quick glimpse of what this could look like in English ministries for ambassador and host. We need to teach well. We need to learn about SLA second language acquisition. We need to learn and grow. Wherever we are at right now in our understanding, we need to continue to read and add to that. Same for host. In both of those positions, we need the, to do that. We need to know our subject, and if we are an ambassador in another place, we may have an opportunity to be learning more about English from local English teachers. I, this is something that I strongly encourage. If I am working with short-term mission uh, people who have come to Brazil to teach English for a while, I'll say, learn about English from the Brazilian English teachers. They can help you in that. So we may be in a position to tap into local teachers for learning, and we may also be able to tap into our students to learn more about the English language and about how people who are learning it approach it. Um, use developmental teaching methods. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. Now, this is my first set, more about teaching. And we, some of us may feel like, okay, this is, this is back to the not sure where my effectiveness is on some of these things. And we are all growing in our teaching effectiveness. And I have days where I'm like, Oh my goodness, that lesson just really did not go like I planned. And so this, I think, is an area of growth for all of us at all times. 
Sometimes we may be ineffective at it, just like pets were in my family. But in the next set, I believe are things related to ministry that we can all do, and we can all implement pretty much immediately. We can be transparent about who we are. And if we are a host, we can be transparent about our organization. Why are we there? What are we hoping to do? What are our goals? Who are we? Just as when I walked onto the Muslim campus, uh, uh, school campus, I started out by saying, I am a Christian and my husband is teaching in a seminary. I proceeded from there. <laughs> Use edifying personal materials. Now, this is something that I think sometimes we need a little work on because in the first set, if we feel like we may not know enough about teaching English, what is our temptation? I'm going to get a set of books that's going to lay it all out for me. And then I don't have to worry about my lack of expertise because it's all there in the book. Well, that could be helpful, but we also can really benefit from using personal materials. And I do talk more about that in my book. But sharing faith stories and using faith building materials, when we are in our own space, this is something that we can do. And forming personal relationships is something that we can always do. And when we are in our own space, I believe that we can form purposeful, spiritual mentoring relationships. So the last set there, I think we can be more purposeful about that. I have often walked into spaces in Christian organizations that were transparent and people knew what they were getting into and yet they are using, and yet they are using purely secular materials. I think we can add to that materials that will be of a spiritual nature. And I will wrap it up here soon. Um, uh, that, last, that last site had a task-based checklist, and I can show you that um, out there if any of you want to see where it is in my book, but you can also get it here on this site, and I'll be happy to give that to any of you. If you want to email me, I can send you the link. And I just want to close by saying that... Um, my being here today is a testimony to God's faithfulness because we were unexpectedly pulled out of Kenya after just a year there. We had gone with a different organization just to go to Kenya. It was un inconceivable that we were given no reason. We, it was the hardest thing I've ever faced in ministry. We had planned to stay in Kenya the rest of our lives. God gave me a job at Messiah College, which started August 1st. On August 16th, I had to have emergency surgery. I had a twisted colon, twisted in two places. It was a defect that, you know, who sees their colon? Who knows you have a defect of colon? I, you know, I didn't know. But the surgeon told me this was bound to happen sometime. Guess when it happened? After God had taken us out of Kenya and placed us in Pennsylvania, and two weeks after I got on insurance. So God knew that that was going to happen, and I would have died had we been in Kenya when that happened. Testimony to God's faithfulness. And then our daughters ended up both getting married, and I would, had I been in Kenya, I would have missed all the preparation for that. Wedding number one was in December. Wedding number two is coming up in July. And... Finally, God has given me great opportunities to minister to students at Messiah, and several of these young women are already planning on going overseas. So I just want to close by saying that God knows, knows our paths, and what seemed so devastating to us in December of 2011 when we were taken out of Kenya now looks a lot different. And I praise God for his faithfulness. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for 
guiding our steps and directing our paths. I thank you that we can trust you, that you are faithful. And I thank you that you have ordained the use of English for your purposes and the teaching of English for your purposes. And you are bringing so many people to know your truths through English classes. And I ask that you would help us to know how to have integrity and effectiveness in the things that we do in our teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.